Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, it's the post-game podcast from the Timberwolves win over the Detroit Pistons. And yes, the Timberwolves won the game. They avoided being the Pistons' fifth win on the season. But it was ugly at times. The defense no-showed in this one. I want to break down what happened on the defensive end of the floor and also a couple of players that helped pull the Wolves out of uh, this kind of in-game funk and help them end up with a seven-point win over the Pistons. We'll break the whole thing down on the show today. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked on Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Happy Thursday, everybody. And uh, it is a happy Thursday. It's also a game day. The Wolves host the uh, the Memphis Grizzlies this evening. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, but the Wolves did beat the Detroit Pistons on the road Wednesday night. It's the post-game pod. We're going to break the whole thing down. As rocky as it was, there's uh, a few things to say about this one. I have some key takeaways. Uh, You know, a couple of players in particular I thought played really well in this one. So we'll we'll get to all that here on the show today. A big thank you, first of all, for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Locked On Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Locked On T-Wolves and also at B Beacon with two Bs, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right, so coming into this one, we previewed it on Wednesday's show. I was a bit apprehensive. I thought the Wolves would win. I thought um, at the time I was guessing the line would be around 14. I believe that the line on FanDuel ended up being 13. The Wolves obviously did not cover that. They only won by seven. It was hovering in that 12 to 14 point range for a while toward the end of the game. Uh, When I recorded the podcast on, uh, uh, when I recorded Wednesday's show, I wasn't sure if Boyan Bogdanovich was going to play. He'd missed the last couple of games. I think it was officially questionable at the time. And he did play in this game. Of course, still no Cade Cunningham uh, for Detroit. So it was, it was really Bogdanovich was, was the, uh, the big one that he was back. And sure enough, he had a big game for them to start out. So I want to talk a little bit about the game flow, kind of what, what happened over the course of the game, and then hit some key takeaways and individual studs and duds in this one. Of course, Detroit, uh, you know, coming in was four and 36 on the season. They did just get their fourth win of the season um, last time out, though. So they they were looking for a second consecutive win. They beat the Wizards on Monday. They had been three and 36, beat the Wizards Monday, came in four and 36. So now they're midway, halfway through their schedule exactly after this game against the Wolves. And thankfully, Minnesota was able to hold on late. But this was really the story here was Minnesota was not um, for, I would say for like 80% of the game, the offense was actually really good for the Wolves. Now, of course, Detroit's not a good defensive team. They're not a good anything team. They're now four and 37, right? They're 28th in defensive rating on basketball reference and they're uh, let's see where are they on cleaning the glass they're 29th on cleaning the glass so they're they're horrible they're a bottom three defense no matter how you slice it so it's not maybe a surprise that the wolves offense was looked so great against them the problem is that they gave up 40 points in the first quarter to a horrendous offense again no matter how you slice it it's a bad offense it's it's a uh, 26th on cleaning the glass in terms of defense or offensive rating excuse me and also 26th on basketball reference. So a bottom four offense in the league. Minnesota allowed them 40 points in the first quarter. Now, a huge part of this was Bogdanovich in his first game. And he only missed a couple of games. But Boyan Bogdanovich in his first game back from a couple of game absence was fantastic early in this game. And, and I don't know if it was just, you know, guys were just expecting the Pistons to roll over. They were, you know, didn't realize how good Bogdanovich was. I don't know what it was. Jade McDaniel struggled to stay in front of him. Uh, and, and certainly he wasn't the only one. Jaden Ivey lived in the paint early in this game. Uh, Pistons had a couple of offensive rebounds and it was just kind of, it was almost like a track beat. There was really no, um, and there weren't a ton of fouls called early. So like there was a little bit of flow to the game, but it was just kind of like a no defense flow. Like it was just, 
it was almost just watching a couple of bad teams play. Like that's what it felt like as good as the Wolves offense looked in the first quarter, the defense was equally as bad. So it was like going back in time to some of the bad Wolves teams from 10, 12 years ago and watching them play is kind of what it felt like just in terms of like, if you were just kind of numb to it and watching the basketball unfold before you, that's what this felt like. Obviously not necessarily stylistically or any of that stuff, but it was weird. It was not a pleasant quarter of basketball, despite the score being 40 to 39. It just felt gross is the best way to put it. Now, the second quarter flipped a bit for Minnesota. Uh, a few minutes into the second quarter, it was kind of more the same. But Chris Finch went to a 2-1-2 zone. And it actually first, I think, I believe Rudy was on the floor. He was back in the game in the second quarter in the middle of the zone. And then he came out and Kat stayed in or came in and they stayed in the zone. And it kind of knocked the Pistons you know, eventually they hit a couple of threes and the Wolves switched back out of it. Of course, they never play zone for more than a couple of possessions at a time, a few possessions, a small handful of possessions in a row. But it almost kind of snapped the Wolves out of their funk on the defensive end of the floor is what it felt like to me. And suddenly they were more active. The rotations were crisper on defense. Uh, their hands were in passing lanes more like it just kind of felt like they were more locked in after playing just a few possessions in zone. And I don't know if like it just kind of makes you see the game differently and you had to like recalibrate what your ex what the expectations for you as an individual player are, uh, you know, on the defensive end of the floor for just a moment. And maybe that helps helps kind of, um, I don't know, wake them up each it week that wake them each up individually and then collectively as a unit. And they only gave up 22 points in the second quarter. They gave up in the first quarter, uh, by my count, 22 paint points alone in the first quarter, 22 paint points on the way to 40 in the first quarter by the Pistons. And then the second quarter, the Wolves only gave up 22 points total. Now, that still meant they gave up 62 and a half because the first quarter was so bad. But the offense continued to, to, to operate really well in the second quarter. And they scored, you know, 31 more after scoring 39 in the first. They were up 70 to 62 at halftime. And it felt like, okay, if they can avoid a couple of silly turnovers, because there were a few more of those again in this game. And um, if they can just lock in defensively for like half a quarter, they should win this game by 20. That's what this felt like. But then in the third quarter, it was kind of more of the same. And it took until really late third quarter, mid-late third quarter, when Nikhil Alexander-Walker, we'll talk a lot more about him here in a minute, when he kind of led this, um, I don't know, resurgence for the Wolves. And along the way, like other guys were playing well, like Carl Anthony Towns was perfect from outside the arc. Five of five, hit a bunch of threes in each half, like was really good. Jade McDaniels was very good offensively in this game. Uh, and we'll talk more about both of them. But it was Nikhil Alexander-Walker locking in in the third quarter on both ends of the floor. You look at the box courts, it's not, you know, it's not eye-popping for Nikhil. But he was fantastic and I thought was a catalyst for how the game closed for Minnesota. And, and they did get up by as many 17 points in the fourth quarter. And they should have won by 20. Like at that point, they should have put their foot down and locked in defensively and be like, all right, this thing can snowball in a good way for us. But instead... They allowed the Pistons, and the Pistons, actually, to their credit, I thought the Pistons' shot making was pretty mediocre for most of the game. The Wolves were just matadoring them into the paint. But late in the game, they hit a couple of tougher shots. They hit some contested shots. Mike Conley allowed some penetration, but, you know, got good shot contests. And it was, you know, again, Jaden Ivey and, and uh, to a lesser extent, Killian Hayes. But um, Ivey and, uh, you know, a couple guys off the bench, I guess it was really, he was the one that hurt them the most. Um, but, uh the activity of the Pistons, the, their ability to get into the paint or at least to to drive inside the arc and, and get close to the paint. Um, they hit some tough shots late in the game, and that kind of made this thing. I made it a single digit one, right? Like the Wolves put in a bunch of reserves in the final one minute and the Pistons got it to within seven. Um, and I mean, like Troy Brown and Shake Milton each played one minute and sure. Yeah, they're minus five in the plus minus column. Um, so, you know. Credit to the Pistons for continuing to battle. Uh, disappointing to me, like certainly the first quarter defense was the most disappointing thing, but the way they closed the game when it was 17 partway through the fourth quarter, and they could have just pushed it to 20 or, or kept it above 15 and just ended it. Instead, they allowed it to get down to 12 and then garbage time. The Pistons uh, players on the floor were able to, to get it all the way down to seven points. Um, So I think kind of, you know, decent middle of the game was bookended by I would say lackadaisical, a lackadaisical performance, a pretty, I'll call it a limited effort on, on especially on defense from this team. Um, and, and it was a disappointing end to the game for sure. I do want to highlight some individual performances. I mentioned the three guys that I'm most impressed with. And yeah, we'll talk individual studs and duds too, but I want to go a little bit more in depth on Alexander Walker and, um, and some of the stuff that happened kind of middle stages of the game. So we'll do all that here next. 
Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch your winnings roll in. Basketball season now, we're just at about the midway point. Football season, we're in the divisional round of the playoffs. Only three more weekends of football, if you include the Super Bowl, that is. So only two more weekends of multiple NFL games. There's still time to take part in the specials league where you can pick combo projections across football and basketball. It's a league created specifically for those combo projections that include two or more players from different sports. For instance, this weekend, the chiefs play on Sunday. You could take Travis Kelsey receptions and uh, I don't know who plays Sunday in the NBA, but say LeBron Lakers play. You could take LeBron and Travis Kelsey, a 10 and a half point combo of three pointers made plus receptions go more than or less than and watch your winnings roll in that way. They also offer a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets hurt for football and basketball, if you have a player who exits in the first half and does not return to the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform that has an injury insurance policy. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is also brought to us by our friends at LinkedIn. At the start of the new year, every small business owner is asking themselves the exact same question. What's the one move I can make that'll take my business to the next level in 2024. LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success all depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's the right time of year to do it. People are seeking new jobs and uh, you are looking to, to shore up your team uh, to ensure that you're in the right place. LinkedIn, of course, isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. It's so easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate with LinkedIn within 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn also knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and may not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. Post your job for free. That's free at linkedin.com slash Locked on NBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked on sports today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked on plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked on sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel. All right. So uh, I already talked a little bit about the game flow and overall, I guess, disappointment. Some quick takeaways here for you. Number one, I talked about how the first quarter offense, well, it was nice. It kind of felt gross because of how bad the defense was. Overall, though, I should say, for the game, the Wolves offense did flow nicely, albeit against a bad defensive team. That caveat, I think it bears repeating, so I want to make sure to say it again. I, I get the competition they were playing. But for the most part, good ball movement for Minnesota. I would even say great ball movement for Minnesota in this game. Uh, they ended up with 32 assists on 47 made field goals. Ant's had a couple of moments where the ball stuck, but he still finished with eight assists and only three turnovers. I thought Ant was pretty good overall in this game. Um, he's not going to hit my studs list, so I'll talk a little bit about him here. Uh, he got a little bit frustrated with the officials early, got a technical. Uh, it looked like he got grazed in the head on the play, but like overall, I thought the game was officiated fairly well, and I, I don't know that Ant had too many gripes in this game or should have had. He definitely griped. I don't know that he should have been as much, uh, but it was a good Ant game overall. Um, you know, Ant had the eight assists. Conley had seven. Kyle Anderson had nine assists off the bench. I thought it was a quiet nine assists. When I looked at the box score afterwards, that surprised me. It didn't stick out to me during the game necessarily. But overall, though, that's a, a byproduct of the Wolves ball movement being so good in general in this game. Uh, they did squeeze the trigger 30 times on three pointers, which was good to see. You know, for the season, they're still only uh, 20th in three point attempt rate. They are averaging 30, uh, about 32 attempts per game. So it was actually a little below their season average, but of late they've been hovering in the upper twenties in terms of three point attempts. So 
Uh, it felt like the right amount. And of course, they made half of them. There were 15 of 30 from deep. So that was good, too. But overall, the offensive flow was very good. They got into their sets. They executed them well. Um, early in the game, Rudy was very involved. And he just seemed like he was, uh, you know, 10 feet taller than everybody else on the Pistons. And he was playing volleyball by himself down low, like Kevin Love style, like shooting, missing, shooting, missing, making it. Um, the Wolves were just throwing lobs that had no hope of being an actual dunk, but just throw it up there. Rudy will get it. And eventually he'll score. Even if, even if I don't get the assist for it, he's going to score because he's 10 times bigger than everyone else on the floor. So, uh, you know, good to get Rudy involved early. There were some moments I think they could have kept taken even greater advantage of mismatches related to, you know, Rudy and, and his, um, size advantage over a diminutive Pistons lineup. But overall, I thought that was really good. Uh, Jade McDaniels and Carlton Towns were both fantastic along the way, kind of middle stages of the game. Jade was good on both ends. He was, I thought, much better offensively in this game than defensively. And again, I go back to what I started with. I don't know if this is just like going through the motions. Surely it's human nature. Like this team's four and 36. We can go through the motions and we have more talent and we'll win the game. But it, it clearly was like, are they going to try hard? Because if they're not, we're not going to. And the Pistons, that's why this the first quarter was just like, it's just like, you know, back and forth, back and forth, no defense. And neither team, you know, it was like the teams had agreed, like, let's just have a track meet and not actually lock in and play defensively. Shifted a little in the second quarter, but I felt like all game McDaniels wasn't quite the same guy that he often is defensively. And 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 certainly I could see that effort dial kind of, you know, being dialed back depending on the competition or, or dialed up as we know happens with Anthony Edwards. Occasionally we're seeing that with McDaniels and it felt like that in this game, but offensively he was very, very good. He got to the rim uh, a couple of times, which was good to see uh, off the dribble, actually more than a couple of times off the dribble. He had a tough mid range at one point. He was three or four outside the arc, a good game from Jaden and Carl Anthony towns. Um, there were a couple possessions where early there was one particular possession where Ant had a wide open throwback to Cat after Cat set a screen, and uh, you know Ant was doubled on the left side of the floor. It was an easy assist, and Cat never misses wide open from the top of the key, like the top of the arc, like that uh, in the center of the floor. Ant didn't throw it back, missed the shot, and uh, complained. Didn't get a foul call. Might have been the one he got a technical on. I don't, eh, maybe not. It might have been right before that. And then a couple possessions later. They did essentially the same thing. He did throw it back to Cat, who did knock down a three. They ran uh, three or four sets where Cat to get Cat three pointers, and he ended up shooting five of five from outside the arc in this game. Uh, a really strong Cat game, and again, the offensive ball movement was really solid. Um, for me, uh, Nikhil Alexander Walker was the biggest, the biggest, uh, I don't know, factor in this game for the Wolves. And again, it the box score does not tell the story. In fact. Nikhil Alexander Walker had the worst plus minus of any Timberwolves player in this game. It, barely. I mean, he was a minus six. Nobody else was, you know, there were a couple of minus fives in there. Garbage time guys were minus fives. He had a, a minus three. The Wolves won by seven. Nikhil was actually a minus six, but I thought he was the most impactful player on the floor for the Wolves. And again, the rest of the box score doesn't show it either. He played 23 minutes. He only grabbed one rebound, had one assist, had one steal, had one block. He only made three shots from the field, seven points. But the way he played and the and and the moments that I mean, two of his three makes were um tough in the paint. What his made three pointer was first half. His his other makes were third quarter in the paint, tough shots. And uh I, I, at important moments where the Pistons were within a couple of possessions and the Wolves needed a bucket, and Alexander Walker got them that bucket. Uh I, I want to talk more about him in a second. I'll leave that for studs and duds. I want to, you know, more about that direct impact. But I want to, like, that stage in the game, the lineup that was in the game for the Wolves that kind of stabilized things was a Kyle Anderson, Nas Reed, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, uh, Mike Conley, and I think it was Rudy was that lineup. So no Cat, no Ant, no Jaden McDaniels on the floor. Again, uh, Alexander-Walker, Mike Conley in the backcourt. And then... uh Kyle Anderson, Nas, and Rudy. And that was the lineup that kind of stabilized things and 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 allowed the Wolves to, to have the footing to stand on to build what became a 17-point lead and, and ultimately, I, I think, allowed them to win this game relatively easily. It was that lineup that shared the ball really well. And part of that was there was no ant or cat to be ball stoppers, quite frankly. And, and again, those guys played well, and I'm going to give Cat a stud here next segment. 
but they also took, you know, 41 of the Wolves, 93 shots, which, you know, they should like, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but inherently with those guys off the floor, the ball's going to move more. Now you also run into moments with those guys, both off the floor that are very dangerous because nobody else can score. But in this case, against this particular defense, that's a bad defense. Ball movement was going to beat them. And also they shot 50% from outside the arc. So um, those moments were good. And it was nice to see them have success with Ant and Cat off the floor. Now, I would not recommend doing that Saturday against Oklahoma City, right? You have to have one of at Ant or Cat on the floor against a team like OKC. You might get away with it against Memphis on Thursday night too, but not on Saturday, right? So as long as Finch, and I'm sure he does, I'm sure he's picking his spots here. As long as he's cognizant of that, I thought this was that that lineup was very good in this game and helped them um, help propel them to what became a double digit fourth quarter lead. All right, let's do individual studs and duds. I kind of tipped my hand a little bit on that, but I want to talk about some individual player performances here. We'll take a quick peek at Memphis, who the Wolves play Thursday night, and that's how we'll close the show here today. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets for your next big event. No matter what event it is, Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They're the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Their all-in prices show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal before you even check out. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Game Time is absolutely obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. They have exclusive flash deals, sponsored deals on tickets. Again, for anything, football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And with zone deals, you can pick the section and Game Time picks the seats for big time savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, uh, let's look at individual studs and duds here. We'll take a peek after that on uh, uh, take a peek related to uh, Wolves Grizzlies on Thursday night, uh, which is a late TNT game. Well, we'll get to that in a second. All right, um, studs for Minnesota. Rudy Gobert has to be number one, 19 and 16 in this game. Huge early as the Wolves were trying to keep pace with Detroit. If Rudy was having one of those off games, I like I like to think the Wolves still would have won, but they it would have been even uglier because they would have been behind early. Rudy was on point, ended up eight of eleven from the field again, sixteen boards, five offensive rebounds, a couple of assists, and a block, only one turnover, and uh, played a team high, a game high, thirty eight minutes in this game. Nobody else in the Wolves played more than thirty three, uh, so Rudy played a lot of minutes on the front end of a back to back, and um, you know we'll see. If uh, I would imagine, I believe uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. is going to be available. I'm going to see if I can pull it up real quick. I believe he'll be available on Thursday night. So be really nice to have uh, Rudy be able to play those, you know, those heavier minutes. And then now you've got OKC on Saturday. So it's too bad that after a couple of consecutive off days, and I'm sure that factored into, you know, Finch playing, being OK with playing those guys longer. But it would have been great to steal a few additional minutes there uh, and uh, not have those guys on the floor as long as they were in this particular game. All right, um, so Rudy Gobert's one. I'm going to give one to, man, this is tough, actually. I'm going to give one to Jaden McDaniels. So the defense wasn't great, but I thought what he did offensively was important. He had, uh, again, a couple of big shots, late third, early fourth quarter, I think, um, that kind of kept the Pistons at bay. I, you know, I mentioned this earlier, three or four outside the arc. 8 of 11 overall, made all four of his free throws in this game. Getting to the line four times in a game is great for Jaden. A couple of rebounds, one steal. You'd love to see more than two rebounds in 30 minutes. You'd also like to see him play a little better defensively, but we obviously know he has that in him. I thought he was important to this win. Uh, my third stud in this one, I guess I have to go with Carl Anthony Towns because he was so good outside the arc and was a huge, I mean, he, you know, 27 points on 17 shots, five of five on threes, only two free throw attempts, six boards, four assists, only one turnover for cat in this game. Honorable mention has to be Nikhil Alexander Walker. I talked a little bit about him already, but um, those tough buckets he made in the paint in the third quarter. And then defensively, 
the way he defended, especially Alec Burks in the second half, uh, you know, Burks went for 30 plus on Monday against the Wizards. Uh, I think it was 30. It was 20 something, maybe. Um, but he had a good game against the Wizards on Monday. He had 12 points on 10 shots in this game, was a minus 10 off the bench. And uh, Alexander Walker in the second half was a huge reason for that. And that was kind of like the Pistons were looking for an additional shot in the arm to kind of, um, you know, get them all the way back into this game when they were down just a couple, three possessions. And and I thought Alexander Walker was really good kind of holding him at bay. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin did see rotation minutes in the first half, only played eight minutes overall. Uh, I thought he was fine. Uh, nothing of note that he did in the first half, although he did miss a layup, which was weird. Uh, it was a nice move, and then he missed kind of a, a finger roll at the front of the rim, and then he missed two free throws in garbage time, which was weird too. But I guess it was right after he got hit in the face. So uh, hopefully McLaughlin's all right. Uh, perhaps they need him tomorrow on the second night of a back-to-back. But uh, notable that he received a few rotation minutes in the first half. To put a bow on this one, obviously not an attractive game, not an aesthetically pleasing game. You never want to give it 40 points to a bottom four offense in a quarter. That said, it was good to see the offense perform as well as it did. It was great to see them shoot the rock from outside the arc as well as they did uh, share the ball as well as they did for most of the game. Overall, only eight turnovers, even though a couple were really cringe inducing. Um, again, Ant had three other eight turnovers. Overall, though, it was a fine performance. It didn't come down all the way to the wire. Um, you know, again, the offense was fine. So, like, it is what it is. Every team in the NBA is a team in the NBA for a reason. Detroit has some talent, of course. So, uh, you know, hopefully this doesn't impact the way that they approach Thursday's game. And if nothing else, hopefully they come to a home game against a shorthanded Memphis team and uh, come with the attitude that they need to have to win a game, hopefully going away. Now, Thursday's game is a TNT game, so it's a weird 9 p.m. Central tip, even though it's in Minnesota, because it is on TNT. And of course, the Memphis Grizzlies are short a host of guys. No Desmond Bain. He's out with an ankle sprain, has been for a few days. Uh, still no Brandon Clark for them. Obviously, no John Morant. He's out for the season with the shoulder. Um, no Derek Rose, who was in the rotation the last time the Wolves saw them. Um, like... It's crazy. Jaron Jackson Jr. is back after he was uh, banged up for a little while, but he's back and playing for the Grizzlies, so they will have to contend with the reigning defensive player of the year. And he's average, he's up over 21 points per game this year, too, Jaron Jackson Jr. is. So uh, you still got to deal with him, but no Bane, no Jaw, um, and you know, still no Brandon Clark, or you know, uh, I guess that's kind of, well, obviously no Steven Adams. So um, it, it's a game the Wolves should win. I'm going to see actually real quick if I can find the the uh the FanDuel line on this one, but it's a it's a matchup that we have not, you know, unfortunately it's not what it was last year. Uh still no line on FanDuel, which is a little bit weird. Uh but uh in general against this team, they're gonna shoot a lot of threes. Even with no Bane, I still think they're gonna squeeze the trigger outside the arc more than the Wolves do, which is always a bit worrisome when there's a team that shoots that many more per game. They shoot like seven and a half, eight more per game than the Wolves do. Uh, now, percentage-wise, they're actually dead last in the league in three-point percentage. And with no Desmond Bain, that's probably going to be the case here, right? They're going to be in that 30 to 33% from outside the arc. But the volume is what, unless they have a hot shooting night, the Wolves should be able to make up for that volume with their accuracy. Uh, this is a team that is not a without Steven Adams this year. They're not nearly as good on the offensive glass as they have been in past years. You still got to deal with Jaron Jackson Jr., but... Um, the Wolves, there isn't really any glaring like strength that Memphis has with no jaw and no Desmond Bain that the on the flip side, you know, the Wolves struggle with, right? Like I had some concern with rebounding against the Pistons, turning the ball over. Not as big of a concern here. Uh, the one thing would be Memphis does force turnovers a lot defensively. Um, they're actually still at top 10 defense despite having a 15 and 25 record. They're a 20, the 29th ranked offense, though, but they're the a top 10 defense. They're eighth in defensive rating on basketball reference. And they're second in turnover rate. So Minnesota, of course, we know one of the worst turnover uh, prone offenses in the league. Take care of the basketball. That is the key to the game against the Memphis Grizzlies. If they do that and they, you know, can make up for the Memphis's volume of three point attempts with some accuracy on their side of things, this should be an easy win for Minnesota on national TV, um, you know, kind of going away here. And then hopefully they're not peeking ahead too far to Saturday at home against OKC. But that's the next big one, of course, is OKC on Saturday. We will have a live postcast following, even though, though it's a late game, following Thursday night. 
And yours truly will be hosting the postcast over on Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube. Um, I will be hosting and joined by Tyler Metcalf from Canis Hoopas. And then we'll put the audio here on this feed. You'll be able to hear that late Thursday, I guess technically early Friday morning. And then the post game pod will still be up Friday as well. So you'll get to hear me on the postcast with Tyler and then also the pod uh, post game pod right here on Locked on Wolves as well. All right, that's all we have for you today here on the show. A big thank you for making Locked on Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch on the Locked on Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow an X at Locked on T-Wolves and also at B Beacon with two Bs, two Es, C K. Ian. A reminder that Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Lockdown Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, that's all we have for you today. A big thank you for listening to the Lockdown Wolves podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.